Chainsaw Man is a 2022 anime based on the ongoing manga series by Tatsuki Fujimoto. It tells the story of Denji about what if a guy made of chainsaws, and, and also he fought big monsters with the chainsaws. And I could tell you more in this stinger, but if you weren't hooked by a guy made of chainsaws, like, what am I going to say to you? Sure, I could try to convince you to stick around and listen to me talk about how great it is, its surprising emotional depths, but... You know, like, if you weren't excited the minute I said guy made of chainsaws, if you didn't stand up and start hooting, comma, hollering, and you weren't already thinking about all the cool violence a guy made of chainsaws could do, then I don't know if anything I say after that matters. About anything, ever. Are you okay? Try going for a walk. I don't know. What do you want from me? For everyone else, there's Chainsaw Man. <laughs> As you might expect from a story about the future of law enforcement, part man, part chainsaw, all cop, Chainsaw Man is pretty brutal. And I don't just mean, like, the fighting and violence are brutal, though, like, yeah. I mean that the world it takes place within is pretty grim. It's a bad time to live in a world made of chainsaws and men. The central conceit of man, comma, chainsaw is that the world is populated by monstrous supernatural beings called devils. Each devil embodies some kind of object or concept and has powers related to whatever it's named after. The scarier the thing, the more powerful the devil. So like, for example, bat devil? Relatively strong. People are afraid of bats, especially superstitious and cowardly lots. While, say, the toilet devil? Probably not. You're not scared of toilet. Admit it. Skibbity toilets notwithstanding. I'll leave you to decide how powerful, therefore, you might think a chainsaw devil might be. These little guys are just fucking everywhere, man. They're just roaming around, getting into all sorts of trouble, putting on all sorts of tricks and stunts. Farmers gotta worry about tomato devils in their crop fields. You're just scrolling through Instagram and oops, you're not on, you're not on your phone. It's the phone devil. It's a menace. It's a big problem for everybody. So some people have become devil hunters in order to eke out a living fighting devils. But you know, it's not something people choose to do. It's uh, the devil hunters we meet in the story fall into one of three varieties. Either they're people seeking revenge on a particular devil, usually the extremely powerful gun devil, or just like devils in general. Other supernatural beings press ganged into service against devils under penalty of execution, or by far most commonly, poor people with no other prospects than to take the most dangerous, thankless, deadly job in the fucking world. In order to become a devil hunter, a human makes a contract with a devil, an unbreakable agreement which grants them access to some sort of ability related to that devil's theme, at a horrible cost. The devils don't like you. They're not gonna do it to be nice. They're not nice. Usually they want a body part, sometimes worse. It could be anything, though. It could be hair clippings if they think you're hot. Sometimes you just gotta stick your head in their tummy and they're like, okay, you're cool, actually. You can just have it. Among devil hunters, the worst paid, least equipped, and least likely to survive are the ones employed by the government at the Department of Public Safety. Anyone who has even the remotest chance of long-term survival is pouched by some sort of private, corporate devil hunting outfit, usually to deal with less threatening nuisance-level devils. Leaving the weakest, least skilled, and least prepared devil hunters to deal with the biggest, most scariest devils. It is a nightmare job where people routinely die violent deaths. Nobody without some sort of death wish would ever choose to do it. And everybody who does do it is broken in the process, becoming numb to the revolving door of dead colleagues. If not just dying themselves, usually both. First one, then the other. At best, you get chewed up, sometimes literally, and discarded when you're no longer useful. This is this show is a comedy, by the way. And all of this, all of what I just described, is an aspirational world of luxury for Denji, our main boy. When he is imprisoned by the state and forced to become their devil hunting slave, he's overjoyed by how his luck has finally turned around. He considers this an unbelievable windfall that he's willing to do anything to protect. That's how bleak his life is. Denji is hopelessly poor, poorer than hell. After his father's sudden suicide, or was it dramatic sting noise? He's left to pay off his deadbeat dad's debts to the Yakuza. But of course, no matter how much money he gives them, they rip him off and they're never going to let him settle the debt. It's kind of like a student loan. He lives in a broken down shack with no friends, no family, and no prospects for a brighter future. He eats out what can charitably be called a living by working as an amateur devil hunter for the Yakuza, who sell devil parts on the black market to somebody who wants, like devil dicks or whatever both the anime and manga both the anime and manga open with the debt both the anime and manga open with both the anime and manga both the anime and ma both the anime and ma look, i cannot pronounce the word manga 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 i don't 
I can't, I don't know which one. I've been saying this word for like 30 fucking years. I don't, I don't know which one it is. Both the anime and comic open with Denji listing all of the body parts that he sold and for what prices, trying to calculate how much debt he still has left over. He sold his eye, one of his kidneys, a testicle to somebody, I guess. I don't know why somebody wants that. And he still doesn't think he has enough money left over to make his monthly payment. Later, when we meet supposedly legitimate and professional devil hunters, they're also trading body parts as part of their work to literal devils as part of their contracts, like literal deals with the devil, right? And that's not the only parallel either. When Denji is told that he has to pay off his father's debts, the Yakuza guy telling him suggests that he do sex work to pay it off, which is fucked because he's a little kid. I mean, it, it, was, it would not be a cool thing to say if you were an adult, but you get my point. It's even more fucked at her to say it to a kid. Later, the rookie devil hunter Kobeni explains that she started working with the Department of Public Safety because it was either that or sex work, which is why she sticks around despite being absolutely fucking terrified and in no way cut out for this line of work despite her natural affinity for it. Both Yakuza man and the department leader Makama refer to Denji as their dog, not in the way that I would like call my friend my dog, like, yo dog, what's up? Not in that way, but like in the bad way that make that means they're like a slave, like dogs are. Dogs are slaves. The criminal underworld Denji's coming from and the official bureaucratic government jobs aren't that different, really. It's all just powerful assholes making life miserable for the poor and desperate. And ain't nobody poorer or desperater than Denji. He toils all day doing backbreaking odd jobs and at night dares to dream of one day, maybe, getting to eat a slice of bread with some jam on it. Dare to dream, my friend. Dare to dream. The only bright spot in his otherwise miserable life is Puchita, his pet devil. A little dog guy with a chainsaw on his head. And folks, folks, look at him. Tell me you don't love him. Try. You can't. Fuck you. So here's the thing you need to understand about Denji is he is um, a dumb asshole. Uh, he don't give a shit about nothing. He's irritable, childish, impulsive, petulant, and sometimes like even sadistic. He's completely self-interested and completely incapable of recognizing the bigger picture of the events happening all around him. And yet, despite all of that, he's also pretty chill and dependable guy. Like he's loyal to a fault and always willing to stick his neck out for others, even though he himself will claim otherwise. He's just a fundamentally decent dude trapped in a world where that decency has only ever been a liability. And because he cares about Puchita, we get to know how kind and selfless he can be when he needs to. And you get the sense that Denji is only kind of an asshole because life has been really hard on him. He could have been better if his circumstances had allowed for it. The real strength of Chainsaw Man, in my opinion, isn't the spooky monsters, thrilling action, or over-the-top violence. It's not the twists and turns in the story that leave you feeling like nobody's ever safe. It's not even the gorgeous animation or Fujimoto's incredible artwork and eye for character design. Those things are all great, uh, but what actually makes Chainsaw Man special, aside from that the, the, there's a man made of chainsaws in it who cuts up big monsters, is that it expertly conveys intimacy between friends, how relationships are built, what drives those relationships, and what they mean to each character. Denji is treated like a dog. He's told what to do and not allowed to object. He's often said to smell like a dog and treated like he's less than human, a beast of burden. So he sees Puchita, who basically is a dog, as more or less his equal. He's not only a beloved pet, but like Denji's only friend and confidant, his partner and companion through everything. And because Denji's like a dog, that means he's loyal, like dogs is. Too loyal. Dogs of the world unite. Denji even tells Puchita that in the event of his untimely death, his only regret would be that Puchita would be left alone, and that therefore, if he is able, Puchita should take over Denji's dead body, which is a thing devils can do. And he, he just says it so honestly and guilelessly without any expectations. He just loves his bro, you know? And that's all very sweet and adorable. But the observant viewer may have noticed an odd coincidence. Puchita, the cute little guy, has a chainsaw on his head. And we also know that there's a man made of chainsaws forthcoming in this story. Friends, this is no mere accident. The Yakuza betray Denji and, and, and try to trade him to the zombie devil for some kind of unspecified power, which obviously fucks them over rip bozos. The zombie devil mutilates and murderifies Denji and Puchita and dumps their bodies in the fucking trash. The end. And that would have been it for them, too, except for one little stroke of luck. See, devils can be healed from injuries by drinking human blood, something established earlier when Denji allowed Pachita to gorble up his blood when they first met. So when Denji's pieces dribble-drabble blood into Pachita's gaping maw, well, 
you can kind of guess what happens, right? Petrita's going to take over Denji's body and seek revenge. He's going to become the Chainsaw Man. He's going to use all the powers of a chainsaw and a man to chainsaw the devils like a man would do. That's where the story's headed, right? Like Denji told Petrita to take over his body. That was foreshadowed. And that's a great premise for a story. Well, cute little devil dog living inside the body of his former master, trying to live his best life, trying to, trying to chainsaw people at every turn, you know? Going through adventures, helping out people wherever he can. That's not what happens, though. Denji wakes up in some sort of psychic plane together with Pachita, who has brought him here to talk. Pachita explains that he always loved listening to Denji talk about his dreams, like, for example, eating a slice of bread with jam on it, and says he'll grant him a second chance at life if he promises to pursue those dreams, that he'll always be with him and wants to experience the joy of Denji thriving. So he becomes Denji's heart, not as a metaphor, though, I mean, it is also a metaphor, but in, in this case, it's also literal. He crawls inside Denji's chest and, and brings him back from the dead as his heart, as the organ of his heart. Um, and he's good as new. With one small, imperceptible difference, um, now he has a ripcord in his chest that looks like Puchita's tail. And when he pulls it, this happens. <laughs> And I don't need to tell you that that slaps, right? Like, that rips so fucking hard. Like, and I know this isn't good media criticism. I should explain what I mean. But it, it just, it whips ass. It's objectively and self-evidently cool. It's the coolest thing anybody's ever seen. And, and metal albums might as well just not have cover art anymore because they're never going to top this, you know? So just fuck it, I guess. It should not surprise you to learn that Chainsaw Man, like the future, rules. Obviously, it nails the meat-headed, hyper-violent fun of its premise with alarming clarity. The animation is fucking incredible, the choreography is impossibly frenetic and fluid, and I don't know if I mentioned this yet, but there is a man made of chainsaws. I certainly expected all of those things. I knew going in I was gonna like all that stuff. What I did not expect was how much I would grow to love and root for these characters as people. Fujimoto-san has a real gift for making flawed, believable characters likable, putting us inside the minds of deeply fucked up guys, showing us what made them deeply fucked up, and making us want the things they want for themselves. After becoming the Chainsaw Man, Denji is scooped up by the Department of Public Safety and told in no uncertain terms by seemingly best girl but actually worst girl, holy shit, Makama, that his options are either to become their devil haunting slave or be executed on the spot. So it's kind of a no-brainer in that moment. He becomes the slave, because he's horny. And we meet all sorts of great characters from there, each of whom is richly developed with their own strengths and weaknesses, their own desires and fatal flaws, their own outlook, and a detailed study of how they develop that outlook over time. Take Aki Hayakawa, the taciturn and stoic leader of Denji's team. He's motivated by survivor's guilt. He wants to avenge the death of his family, and that is the only thing he wants. It drives him to not only be the most skilled and competent devil hunter he can be, but also to take wild, unnecessary risks in the heat of the moment. He doesn't give a shit. It's all a means to an end to him. His fighting style is all about assuming all of the danger in any situation, up to and including trading literal years of his life to the cursed devil in exchange for the use of a magic nail to instigib powerful devils because he doesn't want anyone else he cares about to get hurt ever again, no matter what it takes. As far as he's concerned, his life already ended when his family died. He's just living on borrowed time now, and the only thing that keeps him from surrendering to despair is the futile fantasy of getting revenge on the gun devil, who he knows he has no real hope of defeating. You can tell he wants a surrogate family to replace the one he lost, but also how he keeps people at arm's length in fear of losing them, and how the contradiction kind of eats him alive quietly. Or take actual best girl Hamino. At first, she seems lackadaisical and kind of manipulative. She barely reacts when one of her teammates, in a tense standoff situation, cracks under the pressure and threatens to kill another. And maybe that's because she was also willing to kill Denji without hesitation, if that meant protecting Aki. And she doesn't even seem, like, sorry about it. You get the impression that, aside from a few close relationships, she's this cold-hearted Machiavellian person. But the more time you spend with her, the more you understand that she only seems that way because she's so accustomed to tragedy. She's been doing this for so long that she's seen so many friends die, she can no longer let herself feel it. It's just too overwhelming. So instead, she lives in the moment. She jokes around and flirts with everybody, just to have a good time. She drinks to excess and, and doesn't begrudge anyone who betrays her because, like, she gets the impulse to do that. She's been in enough situations where she had to make hard choices that she just doesn't hold a grudge. Deep down, she's one of the most caring and sensitive characters in the whole series. 
or take Makama. Makama, um, she wants something and we should not let her have it. What I don't know what it is, but don't let her have it. We would though. Each and every one of you watching this would absolutely give it to her. No questions asked. Uh, Makama scares the absolute shit out of me. Um, th this is, I don't want to talk about Makama anymore. And yes, I know her whole deal. I, I've read, I've read the manga. I'm just not doing any post anime spoilers in this video. Or actually even better best girl, Power, a human corpse possessed by the blood devil with an unflappable superiority complex. Power is selfish, malicious, she has zero respect for anyone or anything else except her cat. She does real paint jobs in the toilet and doesn't even flush. She betrays Denji the first chance she gets. She rushes into and escalates every conflict she can, putting everyone else at risk. She's literally and figuratively bloodthirsty. You should not be able to like Power. She has no likable qualities. But if you ask somebody who has watched or read Chainsaw Man who their favorite character is, they'll either say Power or, I don't know, probably Power. Which is, of course, the incorrect favorite character to have. The correct character, as his name implies, is the Violence Fiend. For a lot of reasons, but mostly because his name is the Violence Fiend. Power's utter conviction that she is a superior being in gleeful pursuit of her own interests at the expense of everyone else's is infectiously fun. You can't help but admire her devil-may-care bombast, no pun intended, by the time you learn that she's actually not that bad, or at least has her reasons for why she is pretty bad, it no longer matters. You are fucking on board. And on top of these richly detailed characters, we also have these complex interactions and relationships between them. Relationships we get to watch develop over time, often in fits and starts. How they struggle with one another, struggle with how to work with one another, how to live with one another, and then gradually, how to support one another. Chainsaw Man is a story about a lot of different things. Exploitation, trauma, institutional failure, resilience, the danger of obsession, the corrosive power of violence, how rad chainsaws are. But more than anything, it's about community. What it means to have a support network around you, the challenges of building one, and what you do when that support network fails you or dies suddenly. The horrors and adversities the characters face are evened out with the small moments of joy that we share with them. The simple pleasure of having dinner with friends, having someone to share a cigarette with, someone to confide in, someone you can talk to when things aren't going your way. A lot of problems in life can't be solved with chainsaws. You can't use a chainsaw to clear your debt or fight your depression or manage grief. I know, I've tried. You need people in your life. You need connection. You need community. And also, I don't feel like I've stressed this point hard enough. Uh, I don't know if I did a good job communicating this to you, but there is a man who is made of chainsaws. As always, I'd like this to thank man, the spooky little babies man. over at patreon.com slash scaredycats. In particular, I'd like to thank Joe McClory, Liz Widow, Jacob Lancaster, Annabelle, Mastin Ginger, James Garford, Devin Kaler, Spooky Heather Sylvia, Eleanor Harvey, Definitely Todd and Danwich Games. And I, Bobby Duke, internationally recognized star of the channel, would like to thank these other stars of the channel. Ben Danish, Jay Tawny, Hoha, Schadenfraulein, Lanstein Tyne, Rachel Rat, Serious Bengal, Kato Moore, Carpad, Josh Manez, Hyla Tracy, Louisa Prito, Comrade Rose X, and Jesse. You want me to say your name all funny like, like I do? Go on over to patreon.com slash